Uh, thank you so much, first of all, for coming today. Uh, your attendance at events like this are what led us to having these events, and we love our local authors and our, all of our community, so thank you so much for, for coming out. Uh, this evening, we have the pleasure of hearing from Lynn Fairchild Hawks about her book, Nerves of Steel, and its prequel, Minerta, with illustrator Robin Follett and musician Greg Hawks. Chapel Hill resident Lynn Fairchild Hawks has authored eight books, and the thesis is YA Literary, The Search for an Abundant Canon, arguing for young adult literature to be considered liter literary. A recipient of an Elizabeth George Foundation grant and a former student of Doris Betts, Lynn helps teens find their storytelling superpowers with her essay and creative writing coaching. Carrie resident, Robin Follett, is an illustrator who loves to see how language combines with images whether with long form web comics or single panel gags. An educator for over 25 years, Robin is also co-author of Teaching Romeo and Juliet, a differentiated approach with Delia DeCourcy and Lynn Fairchild Hawks. North Carolina native Greg Hawks is a critically acclaimed singer songwriter, frontman, and multi-instrumentalist, leaving his mark on everything from alt country to bluegrass. We hope you enjoy the event, the talk, the music, and remember, if you haven't gotten a copy of any of these books we're talking about today, go ahead to the front, and we still have copies of all three. So, thank you. Well, thank you all so much for being here. This is really cool to have a launch party with all these beloved folks and friends here. And uh, I am so glad that Robin and Greg are going to join me because it makes it really a party and it's just it's awesome to be here so thank you all so much for coming for my sophomore novel <laughs> young adult novel coming out and it's about a lot of different things uh, and one of the things i think we can all relate to is the fact that it is about 13 going on 14 and being a preteen and and a, a young teenager an interesting fact a lot of young adult literature often skews up. So you hear about pretty serious issues in young adult literature, and oftentimes um, a lot of adults read it. In fact, 50% of the readership is adults. So sometimes 13 and 14 year olds are kind of left out. And if you talk to librarians too, they'll say, yeah, I wish the books that are for 13 and 14 year olds get a little bit more traction and press. Sometimes the covers skew really young for 13 and 14 year olds, so they won't be actually picking up the books. And I even had an agent tell me when I was actually shopping this book out, trying to get it bought by the publishing industry, I said, oh, well, my character is 13 years old going into high school. And the agent said, oh, no, 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 that's not young adult. No, mm -mm. like just sort of shut off the conversation. And I remember thinking, wait a minute, though, but why is that? I mean, 13 and 14 year olds are in high school and this is a very key liminal age. So like, why not? So I became, welcome, come sit wherever. <laughs> There's room right up here. Um, so I was like, you know what, I, tell me not to do something, and of course I'm going to do it with my writing, right, because <laughs> this is something important. So I basically wanted to create a character, well, this book's about many things, but the four big questions on Minerva May Christopolis's mind are, first of all, will my horrible nickname from middle school, will it follow me into ninth grade? So Robin will be talking about the book we wrote together and he illustrated called Minerda. And this prequel is, this is what they call her in middle school. Actually, she gets this in fifth grade and it haunts her all the way through middle school. And so there's that nickname. She's like, is that gonna follow me into ninth grade? And then the next question is, is the girls who actually gave me that name, are they gonna still have all the power in ninth grade <laughs> and run this school? I hope not. And then the next question she asks, is well, I get on the high school paper because I'm going to save the world with words. You know, she's a wannabe journalist, and at that big public high school she's in, you can't actually get on the newspaper or like report. You can be in journalism one, but you can't really report. So she wants to be the first ninth grader that's ever on the school paper. <laughs> and finally, will my best friend Diana stay my best friend? And so that's the question as they move into high school. And do I care about 
Diana a little bit more than a friend? That's actually her other question. So those are all the burning questions for her. And I want you to think for a minute, like when you were entering high school, what were the things you were feeling and thinking at 13 and 14? What were the songs, the lyrics, the artists that really like stuck with you? What, what really was haunting you as questions? What questions were inspiring you? Because that's the kind of space I moved into as an author when I wrote this. And one of the things that I wrote down, I wrote a little bit of a meditation on what it's like to be 13. And this is what Minerva knows. She doesn't, she has all the questions, but she has a few answers. She knows that songs can save you because this book actually has a playlist with it. <laughs> names are negotiable. Whether they're nicknames or first names, surnames or handles or IDs, one thing is true. We can always rename ourselves. And as Minerva likes to say, I defy labels. Friends are rocks and shifting sand every day. And social media is the rough, sharp shoreline on which we discover this truth and get pounded by the daily tides. There are little G gods and capital G goddesses. There are demi goddesses and capital G gods and many amorphous spirits in between. What do you worship today? Why? At 13, we often ask those sorts of questions. And then everything's liminal. The past middle school can affect the present, high school. The present moment slides back and forth between child and teen, teen and adult, and child and adult. Sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't. <laughs> and when we're in liminal spaces, we have low tolerance for the big lie, the one saying that life is full of boxes and we must be stuck inside a particular one. And every day, there's one more chance to fall in love. You might have a crush on a girl on your basketball team and a senior guy, all in the same year. So those are just some of the things that Minerva is thinking about. And uh, I, after, you know, if you're feeling open to it, after Greg performs a song, I want you to, if you can think of a song or a lyric or an artist that meant a lot to you uh, when you were younger, and if you're not quite yet 13 or close to 13, what's a band or a song or an artist right now that means a lot to you? I'd love to hear that too. So you can just share that in a minute. But I asked, my uh, partner in life, my wonderful husband, Greg, uh, he would sing a few songs tonight, and there's this great song by Big Star, which some of you may know of um, from the 70s, but they didn't get their, their true honor and due. They wrote a song called 13, and the word doesn't appear anywhere in the lyrics, but that's the title, and I just thought this was like a perfect song for a book of somebody 13 going on 14, so... Thank you. Yeah, so it does not say the word 13, but <clears throat> this band has been one of my favorite bands for 30 something years. And uh, from Memphis, always they were called sort of the Memphis version of the Beatles. Uh, incredible harmonies, great songwriting. But this song uh, reminds me of the kind of dialogue that would be going through my head when I was 13. And I think that hopefully you can relate to some of this. Won't you let me walk you home from school? Won't you let
you tell me what you're thinking of? Would you be an outlaw for my love? If it's so, let me know. And if it's no, then I can go. I won't make you. So, um, thank you, Greg. Just love all the soul that you bring to that. And um, I had to bring a couple of vintage uh, albums from when I was 13, because some of you know my debut young adult novel, which has a record player and you know vinyl on the front. My character, Wendy, is absolutely obsessed with records and Michael Jackson. But that's a whole other story, and we'll talk about that sometime. <laughs> and so I just want to show you all and see if you're interested in sharing with me what any of you who are close to 13 or remember what 13 was like, what were some of the songs and artists you loved? Uh, personally, we had Journey's Escape, which had like the best ever um, Stone in Love, which is a whole story that you haven't heard it, you need to hear it. And then we had Foreigner Four, the cheerleaders at our Catholic school got in trouble for dancing to this at the <laughs> halftime show. <laughs> Urgent. <laughs> It was a poor choice for a Catholic school, perhaps, in 1982. <laughs> um, and, but God, I love that album. But then this was probably my favorite cover of all. I would just stare at this for hours, you know, the Go-Go's. And uh, so I would say those are, you know, Journey, Foreigner, and Go-Go's were big on my 13-year-old list. Anybody got an artist that was like, when you were in eighth or ninth grade, that was just your artist? Yes, Daddy. Don't be cruel, I was <laughs> and we got a song title too awesome i love that song as an interesting memory my parents were driving us through france in 1977 and we kept hearing a lot of french and da, 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 Elvis Presley, uh, da, 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 on the radio and we were like what's going on because we didn't know enough french yeah. and uh it turns out he passed away and we were driving through you know and, and then my mom gave me some elvis records to listen to because I didn't know who, you know I was nine and I didn't know who Elvis was and I got a whole education and I played Elvis endlessly for a year on my record player and I know all the songs. Cindy, <laughs> your Elvis fan. <laughs> yes. Devo, Julie Choice. Oh, Devo. The whole album. Yeah. Which one? Devo, Freedom of Choice. Oh, love that. I love that. <laughs> Anybody else got one? Cindy? I actually have a little story, too. Yes, tell okay. me. Because um, John Cougar Mellencamp hurt, hurt so good. Yes. Driving with my best friend at 13 with my aunt, and we're, I'm singing the lyrics, and I supposedly sang them a little too good. <laughs> so she calls my mom and tells her, I think you know, something's going on. Cindy knows these lyrics and what they mean. And now she's this hippie aunt of mine that we crack up the fact that I didn't know what they meant, but I was singing. She thought I sang a little too much. I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that. I know, right? That's <laughs> like me singing the, the, the soundtrack from Greece and the Rizzo character. And yeah. mom was like, no, yeah, don't sing that one about. <laughs> and I was like, what? I don't know. <laughs> Anybody else have a strong memory from eighth? Yes, Sally. Um, the song and all because I those were my favorite wrestlers and I got to meet Terry Gordy and Michael Hayes because my friend's mom was like a groupie for all the wrestlers and I still can't believe I didn't become a journaling wrestler uh, a journalist for a wrestling magazine because that was what I was gonna do when I was 13 and I had all the magazines and I would save all my my allowance to buy them so yeah free bird like on repeat all the time <laughs> on the eight track you know mm -hmm. at our house on the cassette i love it <laughs> on repeat the cassettes <laughs> yeah robin do you have one you know put you on the spot uh, yeah for whatever reason uh, when i was uh, 13 i think i fell in love with genesis mm -hmm. so anything by genesis or phil collins is like okay that's my groove yeah. <laughs> 
that's how we would um, you know, make the mixtape from the radio when we were playing cassette. Mixtapes, yes. Yeah. So the favorite song was you know, Tommy Lee or whatever. But waiting for that to come on the radio before school so you could like lunge for the record. Yeah. <laughs> that's the operative word, lunge, and then yeah. wait till the right moment to turn it off. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Or when the song came on the radio while you were driving or in the car, that like, felt so auspicious, like yeah. when it comes on, you know, at the right time. So, yeah. So, like I said, the the um, the book comes with a playlist, and there's a lot of talk about you know music at different points. Ironically, Minerva, the character, is not that into music, but she ends up being into somebody who is. And her mom, no, her mom, who's actually passed away, has all these '80s concert T-shirts. So that's a big feature in the, in the book as well, too. <laughs> So um, I want to introduce now my wonderful illustrator partner in crime, uh, Robin, who's going to talk a little bit about helping me do the prequel and getting this to, we did this in 2015, yeah. I guess yeah. it was. Yeah. It's hard to believe that this other book is finally here after all the work we did. But Robin is an amazing educator. Uh, we worked together at the Cary Academy. He's now a principal there. Um, we wrote a book together, as uh, Alex mentioned. And also, he's got this really cool comic called The Last Taxi, where uh, Charon, the, the guy who uh, ferries uh, souls of the dead over to the river, river Styx, yeah. he's a ta modern-day taxi driver. So that's <laughs> Robin's very cool comic, among other things that he does. You can follow him on Instagram. So I'm so happy to have Robin here to talk about his wonderful art. So mm -hmm. thanks, Robin. Thank you. So I'm, I'm actually only just going to talk for a few minutes. We're going to talk about um, how Minerva came to be. Um, and it actually starts off with uh, um, trepidation. Um, I, I think probably most of you know this because it sounds like a lot of you are writers, but you've got that blank page in front of you, and you stare at it, and there's that one part of your brain that says, I can envision the perfect something, the perfect word, the perfect sentence, the perfect image but I don't want to make a mark on the paper because it's not going to be right. Um, and uh, cartoonists feel that way too. Um, I, I think it's probably true of, of all artists. Um, so I was uh, doing a lot of artwork um, for Duke Tip at that point, um, having a lot of fun with that, but I wanted to do a longer form piece um, and I wanted a little bit of help and I wanted a, a mark on the paper before I actually put a mark on the paper. So I reached out to Lynn and said, hey, Lynn, do you happen to have any short stories that uh, maybe we could work together on? And she said, well, as a matter of fact, um, she sent me the short story and it was so exciting to read it because it was probably, what, four or five pages? Um, but as I was reading it, you know, the, the images were bubbling up. I thought, okay, I've got the marks in my mind and I'm going to put them on paper and it's not going to be quite perfect, but I can already see how this is playing out. Um, it's been fun to actually go back and look at Minerta over the years because, um, you know, as an artist, I'm pretty hypercritical of my own work and I'll, I'll put something down and think, ugh, ugh, I can already see the errors, but I'm going to go with it because I got the next page due. Um, and then looking back on it a couple years later, I'm actually a lot more forgiving of myself. <laughs> um, and, and that's that's an interesting experience that I've had. Even even looking back at Minerva the past couple of days, like, okay, I knew where I was unhappy with it, but I'm actually happy with it in this part too. Um, the other reason that I actually appreciated and loved working with Lynn so much is because, yes, I could see that the images uh, pop into my mind, but it's... It's a vital story that she was telling, and she, you know, Lynn had alluded to um, Minerva and the kind of questions that she had, but that that definitely came through for me um, in the short story as well. I could see this uh, older kid looking back at her younger self, trying to make sense of what she was going through, at the same time addressing issues around bullying, um, and and goodness knows all of us have issues around that. Um, addressing issues around growing up in in school, all of us have issues around that, positive and negative in trying to make sense of it. And what Lynn did, uh, in, in my mind, was take um, ugly experiences, and we all have them, and turn them into something beautiful. There's lots of ways to uh, undercut those uh, ugly experiences that are around in, in our lives and around the atmosphere. But one of the best ways to do it is to turn it into art, and Lynn had done that. Mm -hmm. And then she reached, uh, she allowed me to play with it as well and, and work with her on it. And um, I was kind of humbled to be able to do that because I think we created something that was actually pretty nice together. Yeah. You know? and, um, 
<clears throat> so there's there's that cathartic moment when uh, she and I are working together. I do remember sitting down in that coffee shop a couple of times and going through and talking about, oh, this will work and this will work and oh, how about this? Um, and then there's that cathartic moment when we release the book and we see how it's doing. Um, and you know, it's it's not about sales, although those are, those are nice. Um, <laughs> it's it's about um, making art that's going to make a difference in the world for other people. Doesn't matter how many people, it does make a difference. Um, and that's actually why I was so excited to be invited to this as well, because it's the continuing adventures of Minerva. And you can really see how Lynn has taken um, the ugliness of the world and turned it into something beautiful. And goodness knows we need a lot of that today. Um, so I'm going to end it with that. And a big thank you to all the work that you've done for allowing me to play along with you and to put something on the blank page. Oh. Well, um, you know, it's so funny because I say the same thing about Robin, too, about making something beautiful. Because, I mean, we, as Robin alluded to, bullying is a, a real thing in so many spaces. And um, the other thing that I think my book, the, the new book deals with is um, social media's impact on uh, young women in particular. Because it was set in 2013. And by the way, that's historical now, okay? <laughs> I, I, just, I, I debated whether we would call it historical, and then a pretty amazing author, young adult author named Melinda Lowe, just came out with a book set in 2014, and she called it historical. Just as my book is coming out, I was like, yep, I, I feel vindicated now because life is coming at us fast, and the pace of technological change is so huge, and we are living through another revolution right now with AI. Mm -hmm. In 2013, we were living through a social media revolution. And between 2010 and 2013, you they're actually looking at the data now for teen girls' mental health. And why is, was it tanking then? Well, Facebook bought Instagram for some amount of billions back in 2012. Instagram was on the rise, Twitter was on the rise, and then Snapchat, all during that time. And when I started this book in 2012, actually, so it's hard to think it's been <laughs> 10 years getting this together, but the, the things I was seeing, and I had a flip phone at the time, okay, I didn't get an iPhone for another couple of years, but what I was seeing teenagers do on, um, at the time, and on Twitter, they left Facebook because that's where we were, <laughs> the adults, and they were on Twitter doing things right and wide open, there weren't private accounts, and saying things that were kind of interesting, really way wide open, as you could say. And I was kind of like aghast, but then there was the Steubenville incident in Ohio where some young males decided to tweet and retweet a sexual assault on, on Twitter. And this all happened you know, right in 2013. And I was so impacted by it, and I saw teenagers around me impacted by everything going on. I said, you know what? But we got to talk about this. And I mean, that's just, you know, we talk about making something beautiful out of something ugly. I just decided I was going to write about it and try to walk in the shoes of somebody on Instagram at that point <clears throat> or somebody who is actually, you know, trying to make friends and keep friends. And now I got to have this whole social media identity. Well, now it's a given that people have social media identities. And as authors, we work through that. But I, as I was working through this, Greg was writing, of course, music, and he wrote a song about social media and we didn't really even talk about this but it's called so lonely and i just love the lyrics and i felt like it really is kind of a a, a nice related anthem song to go with this book because you're going to see lots if you read it you'll see lots of tweets lots of instagram posts and lots of the emotion that minerva deals with navigating all the social media profiles so greg i want to put you on the spot to share right. so lonely Yeah, I was having sort of a, a moment that, uh, like all of us, you know, there's so many things about social media that are highly addictive, and there's, frankly, a lot of things I really like about it. I've been able to connect with people that I haven't seen in a while, but by and large, this it, it seems like even though there's this hyper-connectivity with all of the means and all the ways of social media, it seems like uh, I just saw a, a, a therapist last night. Uh, it was actually on last week's uh, real time. And she was saying that 
we, we've never been more lonely, even though we're connected. And she called it artificial intimacy. And I thought, wow, that is a great way to put it. And um, so anyway, and especially for kids, uh, uh, you know, it's, it, it could be, I can't imagine going to school at that age and never being able to step away from all of that peer pressure. And it's always going all the time. And I just really feel for kids in school who are, uh, you know, connected to that and the peer pressure that goes along with it. So anyway, here's a song I wrote about that. The, uh, you know, the sort of irony of, uh, you know, there's so many ways to get in touch, you know, but we're all so lonely. What, what's going on with that? You know, so anyway, it's called So Lonely. Take a look at you. Take a look at me. Nothing really. part here we have um, yeah so that's a really you know negative part of social media but then again you got journalists who need to be on social media because that's the, where the news is breaking so that's a positive side and then there's also Sally and I were talking about this the other day she did a fundraiser and got all this money for a wonderful cause that she had sent out emails and but on social media suddenly people started giving and so there are ways to stay connected with our friend from kindergarten. There are ways to be in connectivity over Zoom in a pandemic. I mean, there's there's beautiful things, too, if it wasn't being managed by people who were trying to sell us a bunch of things. And I think we've all, people are starting to realize that the algorithm was designed for infinite scrolling and that, you know, it's putting stuff in front of us. So could there be a healthier social media? And Minerva's asking, not that question, because it's 2013 and everybody's just so overwhelmed by social media, they don't even know what they're living. But she is asking about doing good journalism online because 
she really, really wants to be a journalist. She wants to save the world with words. And so that's her, her mission. And she admires people like Rachel Maddow, Christiane Amanpour, uh, Nellie Bly, Ida B. Wells, Nicole Hannah-Jones, Julie K. Brown, and I could keep going. All these amazing female journalists who are changing the world. And so she's watching them on social media. She's inspired by them. And she wants to change the world with words herself. So I thought I would leave you with a couple just really quick readings from the book of the day that she goes in and faces a six foot five principal who's looking down his nose at her and saying, you're, you're barely 14 years old. I'm not going to let you on the school paper. And she's basically begging him to you know, be on the school paper. And um, she, uh, she's really hoping she can one day be Christiana Alampour. So she says, today, this day in history, August 23rd, 2013, I shall learn whether I join the staff of the Oracle, whether I, Minerva May Christopoulos, will become the next Christiane Amanpour. Someday like her, I'll do something bold and grand. I'll bring the world coverage from the epicenter of earthquakes. I'll be that fool on the beach with waves lashing her legs when the hurricane makes landfall. I'll deliver breaking news that cracks the spine of the man, the boss, and every Fox News bully out there. At Nerves of Steel is on it, and nothing gets past her pen. <laughs> so that's her little mission statement. And um, so that's, you know, and she gets, well, not much of a spoiler, she gets on the paper, which is very good. But um, then she has this wannabe stepmom in her life named Lexi, this woman that's dating her dad, because Minerva's mom has, has passed away. And um, she's not so keen on Lexi. So Lexi is, you know, trying to take her places and, you know, take her to school. And Minerva's like, I just want to take the bus. I don't want to be with you, you know. And then Lexi's trying to be friends with her. And Minerva's like, okay, I know, I know everything I need to know about journalism. And Lexi's like, well, do you know who Marie Colvin is? And Minerva's like, no, and doesn't want to talk to her about it. And then um, this is what happens right after that. I wait till they hear, I hear the door slam to grab my phone and Google Marie Colvin. As I read, my heart kicks up a notch a war correspondent with Middle East expertise. She also covered battles in Kosovo, Sierra Leone, Sri Lanka, and Chechnya. Her fierce refusal to abandon 1,500 women and children holed up in a compound in East Timor, besieged by Indonesian-backed forces, ensured their survival. She escaped Gaddafi's oppressive harassment during the legendary interview, fled an angry mob in Cairo, and lost an eye to a Sri Lankan grenade. She wore an eye patch and drank like a fish. My job, she once said, is to bear witness. On February 22nd, 2012, she died in the line of duty, killed by an IED while covering the Battle of Homs in the Syrian uprising. How could I have not known of her existence? I fall on my bed, hugging my knees till I can't feel the blood anymore. Oh my gods and goddesses, I want to be her. <laughs> Up to this very moment, Amanpour was my number one, my forever soulmate. A hybrid like me, both Brit and Persian, a front lines journalist during the Iran-Iraq War, the fall of communism in Eastern Europe and the siege of Sarajevo. I still and will forever adore her. But Colvin? She could be a superhero. If she's ascended to the spiritual heights in the ether, she might be on the Mount Olympus of journalists. What she did, I want to do. Journalism for justice. It starts now. <laughs> You. And the last, uh, Greg's going to end us with a song. The last thing I want to say is that the big dilemma of the book is how do you do journalism for justice, especially when there's some serious bullies in your school and the school administration is looking the other way. And if you know of something terrible that's happened at your school and you feel the need to report it, but nobody else seems to care, should you go TMZ or should you go NYT in your reporting style? What is going to get the attention? What's going to get the story out there? And so sometimes our desire for the bullies to get theirs and justice to be done can be so overwhelming, we sometimes make choices in our life that maybe aren't the best ones. But Minerva's really grappling with that because apparently the people who call themselves adults are not really doing the job. So she has to figure out what she's going to do. And her deep desire is, I think, really captured in a line from Greg's song, uh, What Goes Around Comes Around. So I'm going to let Greg end us with that musical thought. All right. So I, I have not gotten a chance to congratulate my lovely wife 
this big accomplishment. I'm so proud of you. So talented. So such an inspiration to me, and her work ethic uh, puts mine to shame as an artist. I'll just tell you that. Uh, I've never seen anybody put so much into it, and it's, uh, it's really inspiring. So congratulations. Uh, many more to come, I hope. <laughs> All right, yeah. So here we go. Well, you can choose the truth that fits your needs. It's not life you believe. But it might come back on you Well, it's all worked out So well for you How your story goes Really depends on who you are talking to And what they can do for you Well, they say what goes around Will come And if that's true, then I know you are going down. And all the pain you caused, you'll get to know it now. You'll get to feel the way I do somehow. You keep an ace in a hole. And a card up your sleeve, whoever deals with you better learn to believe you're gonna have your way. Or someone is gonna pay. Now you told him a tale, and you told me one too. We both bought in, but only one got you. I used to think I lost, but now he is counting the cost. Now they say what goes around will come back around. And if that's true, then I know you are going down. And all the pain you cause, now you'll get to know it now. You'll get to feel the way. Somehow, if what goes around, but you know the truth has a way of coming out, and you'll get yours. There is no doubt, because now everyone knows, and so. That's why they say what goes around will come back around. And if that's true, then I know you are going down. And all the pain you cause, you get to know it now. You'll get to feel the somehow if what goes around if what goes to have you all here and I really appreciate you being part of the celebration. The book is out! <laughs> 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 out here and the 
if I didn't get a chance to sign your book and Robin didn't get a chance to sign, you know, thank you all so much for being here. <laughs>